Great. I think we've, we've got everyone on board. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for joining today. Um, my name is Craig Smith, so I'm Scales UK Country Manager based here in London, um, where you're probably starting to see and hear our name quite a lot now with our growing presence in the region. Some of you may also have seen us on our very large stand, and we think very cool stand, at the e-commerce expo in London this year. Um, and you may have also spotted that we, uh, we on the schedule, we had our, the About You founder, Tarek, speaking, but you may not have been able to see it yourself. And that's why we've decided um, today to, uh, to rerun the talk that Tarek did on the webinar. Um, so Tarek is the main act today, and he's going to take you all through the pretty spectacular story of About You and how it grew to be one of the largest names in European e-commerce all inside the last 10 years. During the webinar, I'll be monitoring questions, which you can tap into the chat window, um, and I'll pick up some to ask Tarek at the end. So over to you, Tarek. Yeah, cool. Thanks for the intro, uh, Craig. Um, many thanks for joining. Uh, many people here. I'm looking forward to that webinar. Um, so the idea is that I hold a short presentation, 20 minutes or so, and um, then we're going to switch to Q&A in case there are any questions. Um, there's this Q&A feature here. Um, so whenever you have a question, feel free to shoot it out also during the presentation, and then I'll pick up the, uh, or Craig will pick up the, the questions uh, after presentation is done. All right. Um, Quickly on me, maybe I'm, I'm as Craig also also said, I'm uh, one of the found one of three founders of about you and scale. We founded the company ten years ago, um, and um, uh, became uh, one of the largest uh, e-com platforms in the world. I'm gonna guide you through that um, in a minute. And um, secondly, 2018, we also started Scale. Um, it's a hundred percent subsidiary of of the about you holding SE, and uh, which is a, a software um, SaaS vendor in the enterprise field. Um, prior to about you, I've already started a couple of companies, mostly in e-com space. So yeah, been been in e-com for more than half of my life now, uh, and still excited about the industry, even though uh, obviously seen a lot of volatility lately. Um, all right, let's kick it off. Cool. Um, <clears throat> Company, um, the company started 10 years ago, as mentioned. Um, we uh, back then um, had the uh, idea of digitizing the offline shopping straw for the Gen Y and Gen Z. And digit by digitizing the offline shopping straw, we mean the experience of um, that typically happens offline or happened offline um, 10 years ago, where someone would go to the um, offline high street, um, stroll around through offline stores, get inspired, and often buy something out of an impulse. And um, that's actually the vast majority of money spent uh, offline. And um, it is a bit different than in, in typical other consumer categories because um, in, in fashion, customers buy something even if they, ha that they don't have a demand. Um, so you could ask a customer going to the offline high street, what are, you, what are you looking for? What do you need? And that person will tell you, yeah, I'm looking for a winter jacket, for example. And then two hours later, you meet that exact, exact same person and that person has bought a winter jacket, a pair of jeans, a dress, and a pair of high heels. And then you would ask, how come that you bought, you know, dress, jeans, high heels? You didn't express this as a demand. And then that person would answer, I just saw it, um, liked it, and bought, of, bought it out of an impulse. And that kind of impulse shopping, uh, this was the element we wanted to digitize. Um, given that the back then existing players like Amazon, ASOS, Zalando, and all the other ones uh, the large ones were, were more more around demand fulfilling. So you typically go to Amazon if you need something and then you know buy it out, out of demand. But it's it, it doesn't invite you to stroll around online. Um, um, and uh, we we started ten years ago um, not only with that mission but also with the very bold vision of becoming the global number one online fashion store. And let's see how that worked out. Um, we are not yet the, the global number one, um, but we are by far the fastest growing online platform in the last 10 years, I would say. Uh, we grew from zero 10 years ago to 5 billion euro in uh, gross transactional volume or GMV uh, in our last fiscal year. Uh, we are active in 28 countries, unfortunately not in the UK, but in all continental European countries. And uh, lately we have also implemented a global shipping option to test out regions outside of Europe. And yeah, the clear goal is to um, internationalize further and uh, build that global number one that we are looking for. Um, next to our revenue growth, I think also in terms of market cap, uh, we, we have seen uh, quite a success. Um, this is a 
uh, um, there's a comparison here to a couple of names you probably know. So uh, Farfetch, Asus, Boohoo, Stitch Fix, Revolve, um, all companies that are worth less than us. Um, and uh, I think this shows that not only in revenue growth, uh, we have succeeded against competitors that are in the market for much longer than us, um, but also in terms of uh, market valuation. Uh, we are publicly listed. That's why uh, it's always easy and fast to get to derive a market capitalization. Um, how did we do this? I think I've already mentioned in the very beginning kind of our mission of digitizing the offline shopping straw. But for me, it's not only about digitizing the offline shopping straw. It's also kind of the generations that e-commerce went through. As mentioned, I'm in e-commerce since more than 20 years already. And the very first generation of e-commerce players like Amazon, I would say, is the archetype of this, this type of company. Uh, well, we're all around large assortment and great fulfillment. Yeah, so Amazon basically tries to sell everything that exists out there and tries to tries to basically excel in fulfillment. For me, this is more or less a digitized warehouse. Yeah, it's a warehouse where there's a search bar over it, and you know stuff gets fulfilled. Um, that's cool if you know exactly what you want, um, but it's less cool if you don't know exactly the product or even the category you're looking for. And then I would say 15 years ago or so, they, they, there was a second generation of e-com companies born, um, which I would say is more kind of the Zalando ASOS type of uh, uh, company or Farfetch, uh, usually with a category focus um, and on top to a large assortment and fulfillment being focused on a specific uh, vertical, um, uh, also combined with clean category navigation and product data. Why? Because this means you can also visit these shops if, if you don't know the exact product you would want, but only the category. So in this case, customer looks for a pair of jeans. You could go to Amazon, you would find hundreds of thousands of jeans, but in a very cluttered way, no, no aligned size runs, no product pictures, etc. cetera. Um, and on ASOS, Farfetch, Zalando, and the likes, um, you would find a category navigation and you know a bit more curation and clean product data. You can filter well, there's a bit of personalization in there and a, a bit of sorting. And then there's the third generation of e-com, which I believe about you has, uh, has really innovated and started. And here we are adding two more things to assortment fulfillment, category navigation, and product data. Uh, one is personalization. Um, I mean, that is one of the main USPs online can have versus offline. If, if a customer enters an offline store, obviously the offline store looks the same for everyone entering that store. Online, that's not necessary. Online, if someone enters about you, we right away try to analyze the customer behavior, customer profile of that customer. Even if they are not registered, you can also already gather a lot of data. And with every click, we are optimizing and individualizing the next click. About You has 45 million monthly active users. That means there is not one version of About You, but there are 45 million different versions of About You because every version of About You looks different and is tailored to the customer that is actually on the website. It's a major USP um, uh, against offline and obviously also against online competitors. Second aspect is content and entertainment. Now, if you ask people that are doing an offline shopping stroll, like, do you like it? They, they will tell you, yes, they like it. For them, it's a, it's, a, it's a fun, entertaining case. And therefore, we believe you have to add uh, um, alternative, alternative navigational structures on top to um, search and uh, category navigation um, that are more fun. Yeah. And what can this be? This can be in a fashion case. It could be, for example, outfits. Um, tell me who your favorite celebrity is, and I'm going to show you outfits that that person have, uh, has worn, and then you can basically rebuy these products. Uh, it could also be content. Yeah, Think about a, about a magazine, about a fashion magazine where you can buy everything. That is also what you would find in the About You app, for example. And entertaining things like live shopping, for example. Topic that is super hot in, in, in China since years, and we, we see increasing interest in Europe also for customers that, that would want to follow a live shopping show. Uh, which can obviously be very entertaining and where you often buy something out of an impulse. Um, these are just you know, a very few examples on how, how things can be more personalized, more content, and more entertaining. <clears throat> the, the beauty of basically the third generation of e-com is actually the visit frequency. So the basically problem of these two generations of commerce were always that people were only visiting um, an Amazon if they needed something. But how often do you need something? Um, versus how often do you have time, time to kill? And um, the third generation of e -com, like About You, um, has the strong advantage that people constantly visit About You, even if they don't have a demand, just you know to check out content, to read through the news stories, outfits, follow live shopping shows, etc. And that increased fr visit frequency also leads to more, uh, uh, more, more, uh, more orders, actually.
quickly um, on, on the About You brand. Um, so we are selling fashion. Um, it's a huge assortment. More than 3,800 brands are selling on About You. Um, it's a hybrid model. So we buy in wholesale, um, classical uh, retail model, but it's combined with the marketplace. Yeah, So it's a hybrid model. You probably know that from Amazon as well. Uh, own stock combined with uh, marketplace component. Uh, we have 800,000 um, different products on our platform. And um, roughly 10% of our revenue is done with exclusive products that are only being sold on About You. These are our own labels, um, but more importantly, celebrity corporations. And I'll um, I'll deep dive into that topic um, in, in the course of the, uh, the speech here. Um, generally, uh, we are mobile born and mobile heavy. By now, actually, even more than 90% of our revenues are coming through the smartphone. And the vast majority uses our smartphone app. So smartphone app for us, most important device, but I would say generally for e-commerce, also I would say all of our scale clients see majority of revenues coming through the smartphone. So uh, obviously important um, when thinking about new features to really focus on the smartphone. And in terms of marketing, we are very influencer driven. That will also be the first deep dive. Um, so I'll, I'll pause, I'll, I'll skip that. Um, and a vibrant community, as mentioned, 45 million monthly active users and 75% of them are coming to us organically. So not using advertisement or not clicking on an ad to, to go to about you, but really opening our, our smartphone app directly. That's obviously a very good thing because it saves us marketing dollars. All right, um, so I have two, um, two deep dives um, I wanted to elaborate on today. Um, first is how, how did we win the hearts and attention of the young generation? So kind of a marketing topic, I would say. And then the second one would be on internationalization. And then as yeah, so a third, I would say little kind of uh, mini deep dive would be on technology. Um, let's, take, let's take a step back. So let's, let's think of 20 years ago, you would want to build a mass market brand yeah. Um, what 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 would you have done? And I think till twenty years ago, the the answer was extremely easy. If you wanted to build a mass market brand, it was TV advertisement as the number one channel. This was where brands were built. Now, this is not true anymore. Um, we see in our data that if we if we would do unlimited budgets in TV, so basically assuming we are more or less every advertisement block in television, we would not go beyond 25% brand awareness in the young generation. So the, the age groups 18 to 29. And um, so only 25% of them would know us, even though we are basically in every TV advertisement block. Why is that? Now, one reason is the declining TV usage. Young people watch less TV than you know people in former times. But this, this doesn't explain why in former times you could build 90% brand awareness and today it's only 25 so this is this is not this doesn't correlate with the TV usage. So the TV usage has not dropped so significantly. Now the the much larger um, reason for for the decline in potential um, brand awareness being built is actually the, the declining ad attention. So um, I think everyone knows this. You just need to watch a, a young person watching TV. Now they might spend attention to the stuff that is content. But as soon as the advertisement break starts, every young person would sit in front of their television like this. So they are basically not watching the TV advertisements anymore, but they are actually checking their smartphone, surfing on about you on Instagram or where, wherever. So the declining TV attention at attention is actually the main reason why TV has lost its, uh, its, its leading position as a brand building channel for the young generation. It's obviously different if you're advertising to a 60, 70 year old um, cohort. Now, who has filled that gap? And the answer is social media. So if you wanna build a mass market brand today, um, TV is still a channel. I'm not saying TV is totally uh, irrelevant, but the more relevant question is how to crack social media. And um, actually um, also here, the answer is not only social media ads. So obviously you can do Facebook ads, Instagram ads, etc. But also with those type of ads, you would only reach 15% brand awareness. Now, the, the way how to basically make it into the heads and attention and hearts of the young people is through their social feed and not through ads. So it's kind of an indirect advertisement form. And here we came up with a bit of a playbook um, that we see actually and, and that, that, we, that we saw and built successful. As mentioned, we have expanded to 28 countries. And in all of those countries, we have a brand awareness of close to 100% in the young audience. And we have always applied the same um, playbook and obviously also optimized that, black, that brand book. 
playbook. Now, it all starts with a great story. Um, so you have to have any kind of story. Um, our story is, hey, we're digitizing the offline shopping stroll. Um, and we are the most personalized and inspirational uh, online shopping platform that you will know of. Um, <clears throat> and um, th that is a, an easy story. But obviously, it's not about only about the story, but how to get that story um, in the in the heads of your potential audience. And, and here we believe you have to get into their social feed. And this can be done through ads, but that's the less relevant uh, part. Um, it's It can be done through influencers, so opinion leaders. Um, if you are in their feed, you have to make them an offering that they like and that actually brings them to your online shop. Um, and then as soon as they have known you or they, they are aware of you, they uh, they got an offer that they like, then you have to make sure they love your brand and st st stay loyal. You have to make sure they buy regularly through promotions and obviously through CRM, keep them engaged. Let's start with the first, first point here, collaborate with opinion leaders. So what, what, what we've done is basically we've built our own database and we've, we've done something that's actually very simple. We are crawling um, the creators in our database and we are checking who are they following because they are actually often the first ones detecting new and upcoming influencers. So that is a very easy way to make sure you constantly fill the funnel with newly and upcoming influencers. We have 25,000 creators in our database, influencers in our database that we regularly work with. And... Um, we obviously track the performance when working together with them um, by checking the traffic, how much traffic did they send to us, what is the social demographic of that traffic, so male, female, age groups, etc. And then the performance, obviously, how well did that traffic convert, so how much revenue and how much profit contribution um, did we achieve with that um, person. And then depending on, on profit contribution made with that corporation, we then determine whether we continue with the corporation, whether we adjust the price that we are willing to pay for that corporation or whether we end it. Um, obviously, brand fit is also important. Um, we believe as a brand, you should work together with influencers that actually fit your brand. And follower insights are also important. So if someone has 1 million followers, that doesn't obviously doesn't mean that they are reaching 1 million people. So it's important to check how many, how much real reach do they have? What age do they, um, what, what is the social demographic of their uh, audience? And also in which countries are they sitting? So I, am I actually serving those countries that are, where the followers are? Um, for us, it always starts with what, with what we call hall corporations. So halls are basically unboxing events. So the influencer basically gets a 500 euro voucher for an online shop, um, orders something, and then unboxes it, unboxes it and um, shows the community their favorite picks. And um, then obviously sets a link to about you. And um, it's either a fixed fee that we, that we pay or a, a variable fee, basically as a percentage of the revenue that they have generated. If that works well, we try to go into a long-term contract, usually one-year contracts with, you know, several halls, obviously reducing price. If we see that still works well, we use the influencers also for content creation. So they shoot outfits. This, these outfits are then uploaded on About You. And then, for example, an influencer would say, hey, I've, sh uh, I've shot 20 outfits together with About You. Here are two, which I show you on Instagram. If you want to see the remaining 18 outfits, then visit About You. This is a great traffic converter, basically, to bring people from Instagram to your own shop. And then lastly, it's about collaborations and creating exclusive offers. Now, the reason uh, we started this was actually, um, uh, I think, eight or nine years ago, um, when I first, first came across Netflix, and someone told me about the Netflix series House of Cards. It was one of their first Netflix originals. And um, someone told me about the series, and I really liked it and, and actually wanted to see it. And then that person said, yeah, you can't buy it or, you know, download it or something. You have to subscribe to Netflix in order to see it. And this for me was a bit eye-opening because I thought, wow, that's so that's so smart, basically creating exclusive products as a marketing channel. And that for us has worked really well. Um, so we are collaborating with all kinds of influencers, creators, celebrities that that actually, um, where we actually saw brand fit and also performance fit. These are names like Bella Hadid, Katy Perry, Millie Bobby Brown, Lorena Ray, um, Emma Roberts, um, Dennis Schröder, Kendall Jenner, and many more, um, both on international level, the names I've mentioned, but also on national level. And what we are basically doing is we are creating products together with them. So we become their favorite or their personal tailor and um, create products that they actually like wear in their daily life. And um, whenever they wear them, they, they just put a link to about you and the audience can, can then basically buy them. 
And that's pretty cool because if you like Bella Hadid, you're following Bella Hadid and you want to look like Bella Hadid, you have to become our customer because there is no other destination than about you selling those products. Um, uh, third point um, is boost your brand experience. So what we figured is it is easy through um, through collaborations and um, offerings to make sure people know you, people go to your shop, people visit you, and also people um, becoming your customer. But if you want to create real love, you have to you have to build emotions around your brand. And here we have um, we have tested a lot, and we actually came to the conclusion that a com that a combination of an offline event. That is then being streamed online and invite and, and and can be seen through the lens of the influencers works best to build emotions. That's why we came up with all types of events. For example, the about you fashion week. It's a, it's usually an event that goes for one week, um, where there are so many fashion shows, including celebrities. Um, there are thousands of people actually in the event offline, and then millions obviously following these events online. And this can create emotions. Same for our um, about you Pangea festival. It's a, a festival combining music and fashion and uh, that we are hosting every year or the about you awards where we're celebrating the most influential create influential creators again um you know an offline event huge offline event but also streamed online and um, building and shaping our brand um yeah um uh, when you made when you made sure they love you obviously you have to uh, initiate bold um, promotions every now and then to make sure to really convert everyone and keep them loyal all right. Um, next topic is internationalization. Um, we have launched 28 countries in just nine years. In 12 out of those countries, we are already market leader. And um, yeah, more than 50% of our business comes from outside of the German speaking area. Mm. And these are all regions that we have started in the last four years. So we are doing more than 2.5 billion in GMV already in regions that have recently been started. And we gathered a couple of learnings on uh, from internationalization in continental Europe, because obviously continental Europe is a is a is a difficult animal. Yeah, um, you are facing more than twenty languages, you are having more than fifteen currencies. Um, the legal framework is more or less aligned, but there are always specialties in every country. Um, so it is hard um, to uh, to first of all make sure you can at, at all do business in those countries. Um, but then we figured to really succeed, you have to really become local. But we have no office in any country um, and we barely have any people that are speaking this language, the languages in countries where we are market leader. So we solve the localization really technologically. So obviously you need to be local in terms of language. I think that's clear. Here we have implemented after the scale platform, kind of the, our technology platform, we have inter implemented Mechanical Turk um, services where the um, translation of things actually gets done by freelancers and then another freelancer is checking the translation and if they agree, it's fine, it, it goes live. And if they don't agree, a third person is checking the translation. So we can translate shops in no time, basically, uh, only with variable costs. Then local promotions, it's very important to make sure you know about the local bank holidays and um, adjust your promotional days. Yeah, uh, Local sorting, extremely important. If you have a large assortment, we are big fans of basically making that assortment available in every country, but it is all about what to show the customer. On average, a, a user sees roughly 100 products per session. Now, in about use case, we have 800,000 products on stock and only 100 products are seen per session per user. So you have to make sure that the 100 products that users see are localized in terms of sorting and ideally even personalized to make sure that every customer sees only the products that are relevant for him and her. Local payments. I mean, it's unbelievable how many payment methods exist. We have 80 payment methods connected because more or less every country has some kind of special payment method um, that this country has, um, has for, for whatever reason, um, built up. And then local carriers. Um, if you're sending everything with UPS everywhere, I can guarantee you, you won't have success. You need to make sure that you always connect the, the local champions in terms of carriers and last mile um, solutions and here we always uh, deduct um, we always uh, conduct market studies in every country every six months we make sure to really check what are the local payment methods that are relevant what are the local carriers and what is the checkout integration in terms of address validation etc um, that is market standard and all of this localization is backed by our strong technology scale that is also available to um, third-party brands and retailers and also in the UK now so what is scale? Scale essentially is us productizing the technology that made About You successful. So About You grew from zero to five billion 
backed by the software um, scale. And since 2018, we are offering that software to third-party brands and retailers, um, as mentioned, recently started in the UK, and already have assigned uh, or have already are processing uh, another 5 billion on top to the 5 billion of About You um, through the scale um, technology. Um, roughly 60% of our scale customers come from the fashion industry, so our fashion brands or fashion retailers, but also a lot of non-fashion retailers and brands are now using scale. We have customers that are selling home and living, beauty, furniture, um, baby equipment. Uh, we have soccer clubs uh, and um, all types of customers basically selling everything. So the, the software doesn't really care what, what is being sold through the software. Um, and yeah, uh, 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 it can it, it can sell everything. And um, the software is actually made for enterprise clients. So if you are a client that does more than 10 million or definitely above 50 million in yearly revenue, then you are an enterprise client. You need a solution that um, that actually handle, can handle complexity. And the vast majority of our clients from, at scale are coming from either Salesforce um, or from SAP. So this is these are typically the platforms that we are replatforming. Uh, the software the software vendors that that we are replatforming. Um, scale is the fastest growing uh, commerce vendor um, in the world. Uh, we grew with thirty nine percent in twenty twenty two, being highly profitable. Um, that also sets us apart from our competitors, and yeah, extremely high win rate. So whenever there's an RFP and we take part of that RFP, we yeah, usually win that RFP in uh, significantly more than fifty percent of the cases. Mm. And why is that? Um, I think it's three things that differentiates us from as a software vendor from others. First of all, oh, basically, it's us having a better software, but why? The um, uh, first point, I believe, is because we have a, a huge intrinsic motivation to you know, stay, stay best in class. I mean, um, Scale is a software vendor, but About You is, still a, a, is, is, a, is a very important client of Scale. And obviously, as About You, we have a huge interest of always having the best software. And it's not only the intrinsic motivation that makes our software great, but it's also the close feedback loop. So whenever Scale deploys something, um, about you is updating within two weeks and within another two weeks um, gives feedback on whether everything works, et cetera. And that, that very fast iteration and very close feedback loop is just different than on other software vendors where if they update something, it usually takes months till the clients are picking it up. And then it takes months till there's the next vehicle meeting where the client actually provides feedback. Now, the combination of a high intrinsic motivation to innovate um, combined with the fact of the, uh, with, with this very um, short feedback cycle um, just makes sure that our software has a much higher quality. Secondly, it's the full potential of an e component partnership. Now, we live and breathe e-commerce as scale. We wake up, we think about e-commerce, we go to bed, we think about e-commerce. Most of our competitors in the software space are, are, are providing all kinds of softwares and are not really, you know, living and breathing e-commerce on a day-to-day -day basis. For a potential client or for a client, that means we are built by e-commerce experts for e-commerce experts. And if we have a com having conversations with our clients, these conversations are not about upselling a marketing suite or a CRM suite or ERP system, but these conversations are about how to make the client more successful, how to win in e-commerce. And thirdly, it's about significant reduction in TCO, total cost of ownership. I mean, isn't it odd that hardware costs have come down significantly in the last 20 years? Software costs have come down significantly in the last 20 years, yet customers or e-commerce companies pay more for their technology than they, ha than they had uh, 10, 20 years ago on a percentage of, of the revenue basis. And we believe this is the main reason is, is the legacy software that most clients are using. Um, and this legacy software creates so much complexity that um, that companies need to invest a lot into maintenance, into kind of keeping the system running, et cetera, et cetera. With scale, what we see in every client case is total cost of ownership decrease. So they have a better software that can iterate faster and they pay less as a total cost of ownership um, uh, perspective uh, for running the e-com. All right. Many thanks for listening. If you're interested in our uh, software, feel free to reach out to Craig uh, or go through our website. All right, Craig. I think now Q and A. Um, we have some. We have some questions. So um, I'll pick about three, three or four questions here from from the list. Um, the first, the first one here is um, um, from a tech perspective. How does scale stand out from other e-commerce platform technologies, Tarek? 
Um, sorry, I was reading. Wow, there's a lot, lot of questions in the chat. Um, how, how is the tech um, standing out against competitors? Was the question? Yeah, how, how, from a tech perspective, how does scale stand out from other other e-commerce platforms? Yeah, so we kind of have the blessing of the late birth. Yeah, so we obviously made sure the technology is is written in modern programming languages like PHP and GoLink, um, that it's that it's um, headless. So front end and back end are decoupled. Um, that gives you more innovation and more speed in the front end, especially. It's very important. Um, it's API driven, so you can connect all stock sources via API. Um, the backend can speak to the front end through APIs, and it's easy to connect third party tools um, through this kind of API um, uh, API architecture. And then it is modular and composable, so um, you don't have to use everything that we offer. Um, in fact, if you, for example, have a PIM and you're happy with your PIM, keep your PIM. Uh, we also have a PIM module, but you don't have to use what we are offering. So you can really choose kind of what, what you want to what you want to use and what not. And then um, obviously it is cloud native. Yeah, so it's not an on-premise software, but it's a cloud software. So it gives you the flexibility to, you know, upscale, downscale, whatever you want. And I, I would say the combination of a very large feature scope combined with a modern software and um, this compo visit, com compo visit, compo, uh, this being composable um, is, is, is actually what, what uh, customers are usually looking for. And the key use cases the customers are usually looking for are um, unified commerce experience, so com connecting on online and offline through omni-channel features. The vast majority of our clients are, are running online, offline stores, um, and we have an extensive um, feature set around that. It's internationalization, so um, basically um, uh, being active in more than one country. It is marketplace components. So as a brand, either selling on marketplace or as a retailer, becoming a marketplace. And then most importantly, elevating the overall e-commerce experience by connecting multiple warehouses, by, by you know making sure there's a difference in the storefronts per country, per sub-brand, per whatever. And, um, and you know introducing things like personalization, inspiration, et cetera. Thank you, Tarek. Um, an another one here. Um, there's much hype around... Um, AI and large language models. What 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 are your thoughts though in, around the application of these emerging technologies in e-commerce? Yeah, actually, I I do believe that uh, AI and large language models will um uh, will contribute significantly to market growth in the next year. Or so um uh, and and profitability maybe starting with the profitability part because that's the easier part. So through AI and large language models, a lot of the things that humans have done in the past are, can now be done by by machines. Yeah, it starts with you know quite obvious cases like customer service. Uh, if we see our customer service requests, it's 60, 70% of them asking, where's my parcel? When is it delivered? How do I return? You know, it's so easy for an AI to answer these questions. Um, now, typically on average, uh, an online retailer is paying roughly 1% of their revenue in customer service. Assuming that 60% of those questions can be answered by an AI, that means you're actually saving 0.6% of costs um, uh, uh, compared to your revenue. I mean, that's a huge, that's 100% margin uplift. So 0.6% higher EBIT margin. Um, secondly, things like product refinement. Today, often humans are actually saying whether that is a black shirt or not. Um, and this can be done by machines, obviously much easier. Um, but I also see huge, advantage, uh, huge advantages for the customer. Now, one one uh, feature I, I'm a strong believer of is a is a is a um, consultancy bot. So so think kind of of a shopping GPT. Yeah, um, I can guarantee you in two or three years, all online shops that you are or large online shops at least that you are entering will have some kind of shop shopping bot functionality. Where, for example, in about use case, you could say you could ask the shopping bot, "Hey, um, I'm invited to a wedding in Italy um, next year in July." Um, the dress code is boho chic. Um, what can you recommend me? Now, the cool thing is the shop will already know you. So the shop has already a lot of information if you're a customer. So it knows how large I am, what my size is, what my pri price preferences are, etc. It will understand Italy. It will understand July. So it can derive an uh, average temperature. And it understands boho chic as a, as a dress code. Um, and it understands that the occasion is a wedding. Now, that AI will provide you with a customized landing page and recommendations of products that fit to the request that you have sent and probably also an answer of what Boho Chic actually means. Yeah? So this is the best consultancy that you can get. Now, compare this with offline. 
try to go into a Zara and find someone that can actually ask answer you that question. You will find nobody. So I do believe that this whole thing about conversational shopping bots being, you know, the 24-7 consultant in an online shop uh, via the online shop or via WhatsApp, doesn't even need to be on the online shop itself, is a major, major additional USP of online against offline. And it will actually accelerate the the revenues going from offline to the online world. Thank you, Tarek. Um, we have a customer here from, uh, or a, a, a viewer here from um, Lithuania. Um, the question, the question we've got is, um, can you share any data on the Lithuanian market? I know because you, you referenced 28, 28 markets, um, and and yeah, what are your any, any thoughts, particularly about about the Lithuanian market and and that part of Europe, I guess, in general. Yeah, so um, since we are publicly listed, I can't share any you know numbers on a specific country, um, but I can generally say, at least to my knowledge, we are market leader in Lithuania um, and uh, uh, for fashion. And I would say maybe a bit more general on the Central and Eastern European region, we see, um, yeah, we've been very successful and uh, we've seen very high growth. I mean, generally, I would say in Europe, uh, Southern Europe, Western Europe, it's having a tough time at the moment, uh, macro wise. Yeah. So consumer sentiment is low. Online penetration is already quite high. So it is quite matured and there's a lot of competition. And in the Central and Eastern European region, so this is Lithuania, but it's also countries like um, Czech Republic, Romania, Hungary, Croatia, etc. Yeah? Um, these are countries where online penetration is on a lower level. So in other words, there will be more growth in the next years. And also macro wise, uh, it's a it's a very interesting region. It's a it, it's growing faster than Western Southern Europe. Uh, it has a young population. It is very digital. It is very mobile affine. So I would say, and, and it has much less competition. Um, so I would say generally very interesting region for, for brands and retailers to uh, to take a look at. Yeah. Thank you. Just a, just a couple more and we'll, and we'll finish off. Um, this is from Sam Walker. When did you launch the, when you, when you launched the About You brand, um, what kind of what year was that? I think we, we referenced probably uh, 2014. 2014. Yeah, 2014. So 2014. actually, when I said we are 10 years old, it's not entirely true. Uh, we will turn 10 on the 4th of May uh, next year. So 4th of May 2014 was the launch of About You. Great. And and the performance of About You versus art scale customers um, that we have using the platform now, how does it compare? Um, I mean, what, what we typically see is when someone migrates from, let's say, SAP or Salesforce, because this is 80, 90 percent of where our customers are coming from to scale, they usually see an initial kind of jump in revenue and profitability. So the average revenue increase after migration is roughly 40 percent in revenue and roughly 50 percent in profit. Um, uh, so this is obviously kind of a, a one-time effect by just elevating the overall platform. But what we also see is that scale customers tend to outperform the overall market. Yeah, So we see them having an initial jump in revenue and profitability after migration and then afterwards an organic outperformance of market. And yeah, obviously market differentiates a lot. I mean, uh, by country, by vertical. Uh, so it's hard, you know, uh, basically uh, 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 we would need to basically deep dive in beauty segment and living segment in Germany and UK and uh, wherever regions. But I, I would say generally, um, there's a, a very clear pattern that scale customers outperform their competitors. And we'll finish a final question then, um, which is kind of where you started. Um, you talked about Gen Y, Gen Z and how about use customer acquisition success was, was in large part due to your strategy for social media influencers. When you do go out there and advise um, more traditional retailers who perhaps haven't mastered the art yet, um, maybe perhaps a low level of maturity, wh what do you? What are the practical steps that you recommend um, they take, and how does scale help those customers where they have a low maturity? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you don't need to, you know, develop a, an influencer database from day one. You can really start with an Excel sheet or something like that. But I, would, I mean, generally, I think the 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 task is basically. Um, finding creators that fit your brand, but also, um, you know, have an audience or a community that is willing to buy the stuff that this creator is recommending. Um, that's very hard to find out from the outside. Um, so speak to people. Uh, I mean, if you're a scale customer asking what are the advantages of being a scale customer, you can also ask scale. Um, scale has access um, to about you people. So then they would bring someone from about you 
um, in the call and uh, about you would just look in their own database and you know make suggestions to um, to that scale customer. Um, we are we are very happy to do this. Um, by the way, the scale. Um, uh, scale is getting paid on a percentage basis. So it's a take rate model, i.e. if a scale customer grows by 50%, scale, it, there's a bit of a degression in there, but scale grows by 40%, let's say. Yeah, That's why we have a huge interest as scale. We have a huge interest to grow our customers. And that's why we open access to about you. That's why we share our data. That's that's why we you know share our database on influencers, et cetera. Um, so this is a huge advantage for all scale customers is that they have access to the 25,000 creators in our database. Um, and um, a huge advantage for scale clients is also kind of the, the technology um, that sets the basis for good for 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 great tracking and attribution. So obviously, it's the one thing to um, to make sure you do a collaboration, but it's the other thing to have a success measurement. Yeah. So you have to have a tracking, uh, which is increasingly difficult by e privacy's uh, e privacy regulation in Europe. But there are ways to track performance. Um, so you need to make sure that you not only do corporations, but that you actually know what which corporation was successful and which not. And here also scale can help you. And then, you know, as always, start small and get bigger, you know, start with 10 corporations in the medium sized segment. And then I, I can guarantee you five will work, five, well, five won't work and hopefully five will work, but it's a portfolio strategy. Yeah? It just takes time to find the right creators. And for sure, in the beginning, you will have a lot of failure, failures until um, you figure out, okay, what type of creator works for you? And um, and that you build basically, a, a, I would say, a community of creators that you regularly work with. Yeah. Right. Um, well, thank you, uh, Tarek, for taking us through that. We kind of um, we had a lot of questions in the order to can get through everything, but yeah, was... unbelievable. Uh, a lot of still a lot of open questions. Thanks for 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 the great participation and interaction. Yeah, really appreciate it. Right, and uh, and we'll end the webinar there. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.